okay. I've called this the herbivore's dilemma, never enough, enough nitrogen, because my, my underlying theme is a sort of teaching theme is that uh, for insects that live on plants, one of the big problems that, uh, that they confront is, is, uh, is this, uh, the endless problem of, of gathering enough nitrogen. So, so we live in this atmosphere that's full of nitrogen, but how to access it. This is the difficult thing. And if you feed on plants, which, are low, which is low in nitrogen, this is, this is always a problem. OK, so I, I, I am curator of Lepidoptera, but I do spend most of my time working on ants. But I thought I would tell you why I'm curator of Lepidoptera, just to give you a slight feel for some of the things that we do in our lab before I talk about the ants. So it's, um, our interest is in the evolution of life. And specifically, we are. I phylogeneticists in my lab. We work on, we use DNA sequences to reconstruct the evolutionary history of different groups of organisms. And for many years, I've worked on these Lysenid butterflies. These are the, the blues, coppers, and hair streaks. They're found worldwide, all the little blue jobs you might find in your garden. Um, and uh, they're, they're extremely diverse, maybe a third of all species of butterflies. But what's fascinated me are the associations between the caterpillars and ants. So something like uh, uh, a majority, maybe 75% of the species in this family have intimate um, associations between the caterpillars and the ants, where the caterpillars provide food for the ants, typically, and the ants tend and protect them against their predators and parasites. Um, and the kind of thing that we see here are these uh, blues like the, this silvery blue Glaucosyche lygdomus, where the caterpillars are tended by different species of ants, often up to a dozen different species. And sometimes you find the caterpillars with and sometimes without. But if you go to different parts of the world, and especially to Australia, um, these relationships can be much more intense. So if you buy a field guide to the butterflies of Australia, um, a, a, in the description of a, of, of a species, you'll find the exact the species name of the ant that tends it. So this is Ogyrus genoveva, the so-called mistletoe butterfly, that it always associates with ants in the genus Campanotus. So it's a very specific association. You never find caterpillars without ants and always with, the, um, with these ants. And to find them in the field is also an extremely fun activity. You look for, for um, working in the soil at the base of trees that have uh, mistletoes hanging in the boughs. Um, and if you're lucky, you'll see uh, sort of sand working, as we were doing here. Um, and uh, uh, the ants there will build a byre where they'll house caterpillars during the day when it's hot and dangerous. And then at night, they herd them up onto the tree where they can feed in safety on the mistletoes, and they milk them for secretions. And now, <clears throat> the first time I heard about this, I didn't actually believe it. So I'm showing you this just so that you too, <laughs> you, hopefully you will believe it. Here, so I'm sure, I hope that you see that there are many good reasons to study these, uh, these species. Um, and uh, um, just as an example, um, Sweet Peck Quack in my lab built a tree, a phylogeny. And I, I'm, forgive me, but if you're not used to tree thinking, you're going to have to see a lot of these. But, so this is an evolutionary history of all the different species in the family. And uh, um, I'll, I may come back to this later in the conversation. Uh, we found that all of these, they all feed on mistletoe. They all associate um, very specifically with particular ants. But just these ones are parasites, where they go go into the ant nest. And um, in one case, they eat the ants directly. In another case, they're fed mouth to mouth by the ants. Um, this is not the same species, but it shows you what I mean by this cuckoo feeding. So here, the caterpillar is tapping on the mandibles of the ant in just the right way so that it regurgitates food to the caterpillar. Um, uh, and uh, the caterpillars will go through their whole life inside the nest. Now, one of the reasons I'm showing you this is another um, uh, reason why I found on this such a captivating system that I studied it for my, my whole career. Um, here, the, the caterpillars have broken the chemical communication code of the ants um, to gain favorable recognition, so much so that the ant is treating the caterpillar as if it were its own young. And that element that of being able to break the code is something that truly fascinates me. Uh, it's, uh, it, it has motivated a lot of the work, the, the reason for doing the phylogenies, the reason to look for the evolution of behavior um, in, the, in this group. 
Um, we, d we do things like uh, build phylogenies here. This is a tree of the entire uh, family Lycenidae. And, um, uh, and you can use different algorithms to look at the rate of diversification. In other words, the branch length of these DNA differences between species to see whether or not um, uh, there's a burst of diversification. Here you see this in this group there, over a thousand species. This is the most hyper-diverse tribe of butterflies is in the one tribe of humeines that are found in the neotropics. But down here, this blue arrow indicates a reduction. So these are the millitines. These are the, the carnivorous ones that have this the cuckoo feeding behavior and also eating ants. So this is what we find is that when you have this kind of behavior, it's a bit of an evolutionary dead end um, and uh, 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 it results in a, in a decrease in number of species instead of the large increases that we see elsewhere here on the tree. So it's the, so the, the nature of the questions we ask are um, what, what are the key characters that will result in a big explosion of species or in a reduction of species? And we explore those questions using uh, phylogenetic trees or uh, re from reconstructed uh, DNA sequences. Now, the story I want to tell you about today is about ants. And really, in, in recent years, um, much of our work is focused on ants because ants are insects that have many symbiotic partners. And I started off looking at their interactions with caterpillars and of the Lycaenid family. But um, I, we've gone ever reductionist, partly because we now have the tools to be able to really look at microbial associations between ants and um, ants and, and bacteria of different kind, bacteria and fungi, all kinds of microbes. Um, and just to jump quickly to the chase here, I had a, a wonderful graduate student, Corey Moreau, who came to the lab. Um, she's now at the Field Museum, and, and uh, Andy, we're quite good friends, all of us, in different ways. She does have tattoos of ants over every part of her body, as she <laughs> explained to me once. Um, so a true enthusiasm for ants, and she did this wonderful phylogeny of the ants that included um, two-thirds of the genera, just a huge sampling right across the ants uh, to create this uh, tree. You don't need to worry about the details of the tree other than to know that this is the family tree. And, uh, the plot here shows that there's this exponential increase right where the green bars are. And the green bars, um, and this was a surprise to us, the green bars uh, represent the rise of the flowering plants. So over evolutionary time, so plotted along here, the, the ants evolved back here right about the same time as the dinosaurs, more or less. Um, but they really diversified with the flowering plants. And that surprised me, because I think of, tend to think of ants as carnivorous or scavengers. I, I don't think about it plant-ant interactions exactly, um, or at least I didn't until we got this tree, and then started thinking, well, you know, they, of course they could be eating the insects that the ants, the, the, they could be eating the insects that are feeding on the plants, or they could be living in the leaf litter. Um, afterwards, you can think of many explanations. Um, but here's one that I didn't think of either. <laughs> so just about the time that we did this, a friend came to visit um, who's interested in bacteria. And at, over dinner, we were just chatting about how uh, ants have many symbiotic partners. And I said, oh, I think ants have many more interactions with bacteria than, than is appreciated. And she, she looked at me strangely. <laughs> and she said, well, you're the one with the genomic DNA. Um, which was a sort of like uh, having the master whack you over the head because it hadn't occurred to me that, of course, we could take these DNAs from the phylogeny and interrogate them for bacterial sequences to look more at um, whether we, we found an association between particular bacteria and the, uh, and, uh, the genetic material that we'd taken from the ants. Um, uh, so just by chance, a postdoc had come from her lab, a, a true uh, microbiologist, card-carrying microbiologist, Jake Russell. And he went through the very difficult business then of screening these ants from all these different colonies, you know, 289 species, you know, right across 19 of the 21 subfamilies. And this really was a labor of love. It took him about 
two and a half years because at that stage, it was just before the revolution that gets us into next generation sequencing. This was, he cloned and sequenced and cloned and sequenced. The lab was filled with, with uh, plates of cloning and sequencing for the bacteria in these, uh, in these ants. And he found bacteria everywhere he looked. I mean, virtually every ant was covered in one way or another with bacteria, um, covered on the outside, but also uh, on the inside. And uh, so he found these 58 unique groups of bacteria that were unique to ants. And of course, when he showed me, first showed me this graph, my eye went straight here, um, and I read rhizobiales. <laughs> now, I, I am not a trained microbiologist, but I do know what rhizobium does. And I was very excited about that, because there had been a recent report in the literature of ants having rhizobium uh, bacteria uh, in, their, in their guts. And the, those rhizobia had nitrogen fixing, um, nitrogen fixing genes. So uh, for, for those of you who didn't immediately click with rhizobium, these are the bacteria that are found in the nodules of, of legumes. And uh, they help fit, fix atmospheric nitrogen and uh, really you know, so flush nitrogen into the system and allow these plants, the legumes, to live in places in nitrogen poor environments, places where other plants might not be able to live. And so, of course, I wondered, you know, can we, that be happening in the guts of the ants that have these rhizobiales? So, um, we started to look at this a little bit more carefully, and one of the things that we noticed right away, and sorry for all the technical terms on here, but what this is, is it's a tree of the bacteria plotted, um, there, it's a, the convention to use the name of the, of the organism that they're in. And all of these red ones here are the names of ants. So they're Tetraponera ants, there's Dolichodorus ants, Cephalodes, and they're all clustered together. So that degree of specialization in the tree of the bacteria that live with ants suggested to us right away that these are specialized bacteria that live with ants. Um, so that was exciting. This host specificity then suggested that, there, that these bacteria are playing a very important role in the life of ants. Um, but uh, and that, so this, they correlate with phylogeny. This is, they correlate with evolutionary history. But they also correlate with something more, something that's independent of that phylogeny. Um, and, uh, and let me just quickly explain what, how we looked at this. So right about the time we were doing this work, so this was uh, maybe, oh, eight years ago or so, we, this, just at that time, a lot of papers were coming out where people were using stable isotope ratios to look at, the, at uh, what animals were feeding on. So you can look at the ratio of heavy nitrogen to light nitrogen as an index of, um, of nitrogen enrichment, um, with herbivores being very much on the low end, and carnivores um, being very much on this very highly enriched um, end of, uh, of heavy nitrogen. Um, and, and this had been a great boon for people studying ants, because if you want to know what an ant colony is feeding on, you have a lot of trouble. <laughs> people, I mean, there are, there are papers where people have sat beside the entrance of the ant nest and looked at what every worker is carrying in with it. But this is pretty slow going, right? You know, seed feeding, I guess that one is self-evident. But, but if they're feeding on anything more interesting than seeds, they're usually carving it up or sucking juices or and it's very, very hard to know what, what's the overall diet of that ant colony. But, but in this case, you could take the colony, you could take the, the, some of the, the brood and grind it up and look at the ratio of heavily to ni light nitrogen and get an index for whether you would call that colony a herbivorous one or a carnivorous one. And, and this is what uh, um, researchers have done. There was a famous, beautiful paper by Dinah Davidson where she took many genera of ants ants in Borneo, and she classified them. Were they on the low end? Were they herbivores eating plants or, or plant-derived materials? Or were they on the high end eating mostly insect tissues or um, meat, meaty sources? 
Um, so we took this information from the literature, and amazingly, all of our, all of our examples of uh, ants that had bacteria on board, ants that had the rhizobiales, were falling in this herbivorous end of the, of the spectrum. More than that, when we wanted to know, look more into their behavior or in their ecology, we found that most of these herbivorous ants also live in the canopy. So they're up in the canopy where they're, um, where they're feeding on secretions like uh, honeydew or uh, extra floral nectar, floral nectar. So these are plant-derived foods, but they're, they're not, it's not meaty. It's, it's a nitrogen-poor environment for sure. Um, and that, uh, that led us to, to believe that, that, that what these bacteria are doing is very similar to what you see in legumes. So the legumes have the, have the bacteria in their root nodules that fix atmospheric nitrogen and, and allow uh, the plants to grow in nitrogen-poor environments. Here these ants are living, uh, these canopy-dwelling ants are living in a nitrogen-poor environment but still able to survive because of their rhizobiales. Now, <laughs> when I say rhizobiales, that's an order. And uh, in fact, it's, they're, they're in a very specific part of that uh, clade um, that's, that's called the cat scratch bacteria. But um, uh, it's, um, uh, they are all here. here. These two examples are kind of an a exception that helps to prove the rule in the sense that those are both examples of blockmania, which are found in Campanotus ants, like the ants that tend the, uh, the butterfly I showed you right at the beginning. And these ones are known to enrich nitrogen in their hosts. Now, in this case, they're not, they're not fixing atmospheric nitrogen. They're enriching the nitrogen that's accessible to the host by using uh, different pathways to break down nitrogenous waste materials. You, you know, if when an animal produces waste, like we produce urea, or some, some birds might make uric acid, or some in the ocean tend to make ammonia, th those forms of nitrogen are not easily accessible to uh, an animal um, for digestion. But the, bacteri the bacteria like Blockmania will break down those nitrogen waste materials to make, to make a form of nitrogen that's then accessible to the, to the host. And so that's what we think is going on um, with, uh, with all of these different ones. Now, because we're interested in evolution in the lab and, and, uh, the, the, uh, and how a particular trait might affect the diversification of a group, we also then went back and looked at the phylogenetic tree. So this is, the, again, the family tree of the ants, and plotted where, do these, where does this co-occurrence co happen? Um, uh, where do we find the evolution of having bacteria, the rhizobiales uh, association, and herbivory? And you can see that there are five different places. Now, these are five points on the tree, but each one represents many, many species. So we're looking at quite a, a, quite a, a radiation in the ants, um, and, and all of these ones are canopy dwelling. So from this, we would say, um, yes, you know, this trait uh, independently arose five times, always with, the, with having the bacteria and the um, uh, together with a herbivorous trait, allowing the, the, these ants to occupy niches that other ants might not be able to occupy. Um, now, we wanted to know a little more about this in detail, so graduate student John Sanders came along, very remarkable student, who worked on cephalotus. These are the they're, they're, they're ants that have a rather square, block little head. And uh, um, <laughs> so they have a very interesting ecology. But they are chock-a-block with bacteria. So now we've made this transition to next-gen sequencing. I'm embarrassed, sorry to say that in an afternoon, he did what would have taken Jake probably six months to do. So here are the 18 species that he gathered all from one habitat in Brazil. And these are all the bacteria, the different kinds, different orders of bacteria in their guts. Um, these ones over here were taken out of alcohol, ethanol. So you can see that how you preserve the ants matters. Um, but it gives you a pretty good index. You can see lots of this Barricue microbiales, which um, uh, has this cat scratch uh, bacteria. 
he, he asked the question, OK, they have bacteria, but do they have very m uh, many bacteria? I mean, we would think that if it was really important for the function of the life of these ants, they would have a lot of bacteria. And so he used fluorescence techniques to sort of to visually quantify how, much, how many bacteria are there. And the answer is, you know, lots. You can kind of see it yourself. But he also used um, this uh, 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 a technique called qPCR to measure how much was there. And, and again, the answer is lots, lots of bacteria were in those ants. So looking here across where each block here represents a different genus of ants, he went, he went to a, um, a rainforest in, Brazil, in uh, Peru this time. He collected 100 different species of ants. He looked inside their, uh, their guts, and he quantified how many bacteria. And you can see that, um, that uh, there were these three really jump out. And in fact, these are the three um, that, uh, that we also had identified previously. Um, so here, just to, uh, to summarize that, you can see that ant, these ant legume lineages also have very abundant bacteria. And this fits well with our idea that it plays a functional role in their nutrition. Um, and it also raised questions about ones that we hadn't uh, identified yet. Um, he looked at, uh, so far I've emphasized the ones that her are herbivorous and have a lot of bacteria and are using it in a particular way. But there are also some ants in that habitat, like army ants, that are extremely carnivorous. And the more carnivorous they are, the more bacteria they have on board as well. So if you have a very un imbalanced diet, you know, too much plant or too much animal, you're, you, the, the bacteria are going to really help you out and you have a lot of them. But here in the middle, this, the ones that are the, sort of more in the middle, that's, these are the ones that had the lower numbers of bacteria. OK, well, there's one last point I want to make. And that is that um, you can, uh, a, a very innovative thing that this student, John Sanders, did was to take a phylogeny of the ants. So uh, this genus uh, Cephalodes, we did a, an evolutionary tree for that genus as well. And um, uh, for the, those 18 species that I just showed you, he could take the whole community living inside the guts of each one of them and plot that phylogeny on the phylo pre-existing phylogeny of the ants. And the question is, do you see a pattern of co-diversification? Um, here's just a way to visualize it. The, the blue dar, um, lines here, this is the phylogeny of the ants. And everywhere you see a lot of blue, it means that there was a lot of co-speciation um, co or co-diversification of the bacteria. And, and running all along the wheel here are the different lineages of bacteria that he found in those guts um, of the bacteria with, with the ants. So you see these red dots here. Everywhere there's a red dot, it means that lineage of bacteria co was co-diversifying with the whole lineage of ants. Now, why is this interesting? Um, it's interesting because you like to ask the question, um, OK, there are bacteria in the guts. How can you tell the good ones from the bad ones? How you can you tell the bacteria that are pathogens from the ones that are, that are beneficial? And his argument is that if you look for ones that are co-speciating, those have persisted through evolutionary time, through the whole phylogeny of, the, of this genus of ants. And it's quite old. If it's a, as old as the mammals, um, and, and it, this tells you also something special about the ants. If we did the, exactly the same thing for mammals here, you wouldn't see so many of these red dots. There's a, there's a real conservatism of the gut fauna in these ants. And, uh, and where you see co-speciation, these are lineages that are likely to be doing something mutualistic. Or that's his argument. It, it, there's some uh, interesting assumptions in that argument, but I think it's a very beautiful idea. OK, so just to summarize, um, when I talk about ants as legumes, I hope you appreciate that there is a slight difference here. Uh, the analogy is ants are like legumes because they can live in nitrogen-poor um, environments uh, by virtue of their bacteria. But they're different from legumes in the sense that legumes are fixing atmospheric nitrogen, so bringing nitrogen into the ecosystem. Whereas in the case of the, these ants, the, their bacteria are 
enabling them to break down waste products in different ways. But it still, it still releases more nitrogen to them either way. And so I think it's a, that's why I think it's a very useful analogy. Um, and uh, that's my summary. I think I've just uh, said it, except this notion of co-diversification being a way of indicating uh, mutualism could be a very useful, uh, useful take-home message for, for all of us. So with that, uh, these are some of the people who helped with all the work for my lab. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to try to pick up on some of these themes. Uh, Naomi and I had been in some conversation the days before, and so I was, wanted to talk about some projects and ideas that I felt might um, be mutualistic with the kinds that uh, she was talking about today with her research. Um, I did want to just start out the talk uh, real briefly by saying, uh, acknowledging sort of my own background in biology, so, and, and in fact, in studying ants as well. So this is a photograph from my own, like a, uh, dissertation research on, on ants, um, the ecology and evolution of, of colony organizations. So here's my friend Ray Sandwald is in Long Island digging up some ants with me, uh, but another one of my field sites was in Florida. So it, there was this aspect to it, but then, so those are the creatures, I guess these are the things. These are the ant farms that we would grow the ants in to then um, observe and analyze their behaviors. Because one of the questions I was really interested in then was like understanding interactions and dynamics of ant colonies. Like what makes a colony a colony? Is it an individual? Um, how do parts make a meaningful whole? And it's really this sort of idea, in this case it's a diagram of, of different um, casts of ants in a colony and their physical interactions. But I wanted to show this diagram and just give that preface to give some sense of genealogy and how this might connect to the kind of um, work I'm doing now. So uh, this is a paper from, uh, this was work done in a paper from uh, journal Biological Theory in 2007. Um, but then this is a diagram that I did just this last year. So I just sort of wanted to contrast these two uh, diagrams. So. Um, the, the former was one of scientific practice, and this one arguably really is really a, a more of the artistic practice in the mode that I'm working in primarily right now. And so it's also mar uh, marking out interactions, but not necessarily just of cause and effect. There's also um, cause and affect. There's, there's similarity and analogy. There's the artifactual and the factual. There's a lot of things that in a scientific practice you really can't go to in terms of trying to understand um, the interactions and associations that emerge when you're trying to think about a meaningful whole, as you might say even as a scientist with an ant colony. Um, so I just want to talk about this example briefly to give a sense of what do I mean by this idea of the parts and the meaningful whole. Um, so in the middle you can see there there's this mention of the Bosporus in Istanbul. And, um, that was a diagram that was being generated for a project that I did do last year for the Istanbul Biennial, uh, focusing on the Bosporus. So on that invitation, the Bosporus is the, the pl place I decided to start. And um, one of the ambitions of this project was actually to think about the Bosporus in some kind of different way. Because for me, and I think for many people, it has really this association of the boundary of East and West, um, you know, of the Asian and the European. Um, you know, of these, these civilizations. And this has always really deeply bothered me. And since I'd never been to Istanbul, what business do I have going there to make art about it? I felt like I had to grasp onto the, the one thing that I knew the most in terms of um, an observation. And this, this will connect to these other projects in a moment. So the place I, I started, and I'll just run through this really quickly, there isn't enough time to unpack the whole project, is thinking about what the term Bosporus even means, which turns out to be passage of the ox, because it refers to the myth of Io, um, who was turned uh, as a Greek priestess who was um, ra raped by Jupiter, then turned into an ox, and then had to flee Greece by uh, swimming across the Bosporus. So the Bosporus Strait actually recognizes this, this is particular mythological Io. But given my background and training, when I think of Io, actually the very first thing I think of isn't um, Io the cow. That's a painting story by Giovanni Castiglione from the 17th century of Io. And you can see Jupiter and Juno in the background. I think of um, the closest moon to Jupiter, Io, the, the moon that Galileo discovered in 1609 that helped, um, dis uh, helped firmly um, uh, prove, well prove, confirm the heliocentric theory of the solar system in which he was later put under house arrest and his book was banned for years. So anyway, this idea was like trying to generate a dialogue in some sense of um, 
between these two different IOs. And just as there's a Bosporus, of course, at IO cross, there's a Bosporus crossing IO. Um, the, the astrogeologists have designated a space. But the idea here, uh, the, mean, the reason to talk about this is this project, again, is kind of vast. There's sound components. There's um, a lot of symbols involved. There's um, Galileo's text. There's a radar, military radar dish that's part of um, the Bosporus Strait that's all part of this larger project. And there's even dolphins that are connected to this in terms of the interspecies relationship between the bandwidth of dolphin song and ship noise that happens in the Bosporus Strait. But all this is say is if you ever want to look into this project, uh, it's sort of conceit is that I'm trying to do a natural history um, of the Bosporus that's different from one that's then premised on this idea again of the East and the West. It was a project about reorientating or even disorienting this idea of the Orient and the Occident, right? Really changing the way we think about conventional notions of what a natural history means culturally by expanding it into this more multinatural and even astronomical space. Um, these are just some images. Uh, I could talk about it, but this is a um, part of the installation. There's a good reason that there's 150 symbols there that you can play, but I won't go into it. Paintings of Io that is actually uh, with water from the Bosporus Strait. Um, this research table that's part of this natural history, and of course a telescope there at the exhibition space that allows you to look um, for Io or look at the Bosporus Strait uh, as you choose. So the whole idea behind this, though, is this question of natural history. So well, what I really want to talk about is natural history. And so what do I mean by expanded natural history? So I'd say that that's one way to talk about the next two projects that are especially connected to mutualism that I just want to briefly mention. And so I took this um, interaction here. This is a husband and wife who are part of this project, naturalhistoriesproject.org, but that sort of interrogating what does it even mean to, to do natural history? And I really think this is an interesting exchange. She says, the first word for Simone, their, their girl, was the dogs, which was woof, woof, woof. And that's what she does now. She likes to go through a series of animal sounds and shake her head and say, no, that's not what it was. Um, that's her game. She likes to, uh, that's the game she likes to interact with people. Um, and then Joshua, the father, it's as if natural history is not only the oldest human endeavor, it's almost the first. It's the first thing you're doing. The first thing you're doing is trying to find out who your community is. And I think this is really interesting because in the sense of community, you notice that there's the girl who's um, tr interacting in a sense, you know, um, with the dog, right, medically, woof, woof, woof. But then it's the game she likes to interact with people with. So in fact, her relationship with the animal is a way to bridge her interaction with other people. It's in fact the medium by which she's engaging linguistically with others. And then, of course, there's this whole question of who's her community. And it, so the community, of course, is her, uh, these other humans, but there are the dogs. And the dogs, of course, are so interesting because of our long history of domestication, of mutualism with dogs as a species. So I think this is a very interesting idea that compounds in this idea of natural history is trying to find out who your community is. And I think that Naomi's work with um, this question of uh, who the community is for an ant, be it a micro, uh, uh, micro, microbiome community or, or a, a caterpillar, um, might be then posed to us also as humans. Because, and, and so what I would say is that the diagram I showed you of the, art, the, the, the uh, ant colony is in, a, in some sense the objective view of interaction. But from the artistic practice or natural history practice perspective that I'm trying to advocate for, you really want to consider yourself as an agent, as the subject, not just trying to uh, characterize a community from the outside, but really say, look, I, there's no way to escape my participation in this whole mix of things and people and creatures, so I am also part of the community. So the question is, what role do I play? And I think this is especially important now as you consider this whole idea of the Anthropocene, that uh, you know, this proposed geologic epic th uh, that we might be in. The idea that you can't, for better or for worse, clearly distinguish the natural from the cultural anymore. We're just fully mixed in on the deepest biogeochemical sense of the word. And um, it's paradoxical, because in one sense, we're unprecedentedly mixed up with the natural. In one, but in another sense, because of urbanization and other trends, humans are, are actually less mixed up or less engaged with that quote unquote natural than ever before, right? 2013, 14 was the first year that more than 50% of the world's population lived in urban centers. By 2050, it's thought to be maybe even as high as 70%. So the Anthropocene idea, the, this idea is what's natural history for the Anthropocene? Um, 
what, how does this engage this question in a unique way, and how does this connect this idea of finding community? So this is my community, Chicago. This is where I live. Um, and Chicago's a notable community, for one thing, for having architecturally these skyscrapers. In fact, that's the first mention of the word skyscrapers, the Chicago Tribune, talking about this building, the Home Insurance Building, in 1885. Um, what's interesting about Chicago, there's just too many things to say, but one thing is that it happens to be built, like a lot of um, North American cities, uh, in the middle of a, a major migratory flyaway for birds. And so um, the significance of this is that uh, as a city filled with a lot of shiny, glassy, um, mirror-like buildings, this is Trump Tower in Chicago, there's a lot of like reflectance, there's a lot of surface, there's an illusion of depth. But then, if you get too close, you run straight into it. And so a lot of birds uh, suffer from the illusion of depth and transparency um, and ha die from bird strikes with large buildings through the city. And at night, it's no better, uh, especially during this, the fall and spring, as birds who have evolved and other insects and animals have, who have evolved sensitivities to certain celestial cues and light as a navigation beacon get confused by the lights of cities um, and end up, again, hitting large buildings in the process and, and dying. So throughout North America, but in fact globally, there's a, actually a very large problem with migratory birds dying uh, in major urban centers because of these bird strikes, because of this combination of light pollution, but also the reflectance of um, uh, window glass. So here's like uh, one kind of uh, victim of this is a bird I found in Chicago. And so one thing I wanted to say about these two projects I'm going to briefly touch on is this natural history notion I'm advocating for also has to do with this idea of if you're finding your community, it has to do with also attending to whatever you actually find. So this project kind of built out of the fact that I was finding these birds, especially in the fall, sort of around the, the basis of buildings, like dead birds. This is a, a juvenile robin. Um, this is a spring bird. Um, but so uh, I started this project that I'm tentatively calling the, the Flying Gardens of Maybe. And one thing that struck me about the, this bird as the bird was struck was that, um, you know, it's not a singular tragedy. So a lot of uh, um, these birds die, of course, across the city. And in fact, what's interesting is a lot of these birds are then brought to the Field Museum of Natural History, uh, where I do spend some t time um, on collaborative projects. And those birds are brought to the Field Museum of Natural History by this group of volunteer naturalists called the Chicago Bird Collision Monitors, who go out uh, in the pre-dawn hours around Chicagoland and pick up birds that have been stunned or died from strikes with buildings. And so some of these birds end up in um, centers that are, they're rehabilitated, but thousands of them a year, um, um, you know, tens of thousands of them that die in the Chicago are brought to the bird lab at the Museum of Natural History there. And um, there, those birds are then skinned, and they're s skeletonized. And the skin and the skeleton becomes part of the collection, the natural history collection there at the Field Museum. So it becomes a scientific artifact. But as I was watching, and I watch every Wednesday, the bird people sort of do this process. And I'm, I'm not much of a birder, but I got me thinking about the other you know, organisms that are, in fact, interacting in this whole sequence. Because it's not a sort of singular tragedy. Um, you know, the birds are also, it turns out, um, caring, right, what, in their guts, uh, certainly a lot of microbes, but actually also several species of plant, right? They're the vehicle for so many flowering plants to spread their seeds um, across and disperse across the landscape. So every time a bird strikes, it isn't just the death of the bird, it's actually the death of all of the plants that are trying to move through the landscape as seeds. Uh, that also suffer. So um, I asked them, what did they do with all the guts? And they said, well, we just throw those away. So um, in collaboration with the bird lab, I've now been taking the stomachs from those birds and dissecting them and taking the seeds out. And so um, finding, basically recovering this mutualist um, from the guts right, um, of these birds. And so I've been uh, generating an archive of these different um, species. And it, each bird is succession. So here's just uh, some of the different species that are part of the collection that, of course, is derivative from my collaboration with the birders and the bird collision monitors uh, as naturalists. And these are just some images of um, the seeds taken out of one single bird, right, and the diversity. So this was a, um, one, one specific bird. This was another bird. And yet another, in this case, you, these are actually postcards. If you flipped this over, it would tell you it was the stomach contents of a morning dove, uh, Zenaida microura. In fact, 
specimen number S11-2149. So you can go back and visit this bird if you want. So there are these postcards that, of course, circulate by airmail, sending these seeds in this sort of like proxy manner. Um, but so, and here's a diagram just kind of over, giving you an overview of this kind of ecology that's being rerouted. So, you know, a bird might typically eat the seed and poop it out to, pl to create the plant that it might eat from in the future. But if a bird at number one hits the Hancock Tower and then number two would usually get eaten by cats or rats, is then taken by a bird collision monitor to the Field Museum, those are then skeletons and skins, but then you can then intervene if you want and then save those seeds. Um, and then actually do what with them? Uh, one thing I've been doing is planting them. So this is a Swainson thrush that died in the fall of, I think, 2013. And this is the stomach contents um, from that Swainson thrush uh, grown up in a pot, sort of, right, that, w that I, a series of pots I've been making on the wheel out of stoneware whose um, feathering, whose glaze patterns like match the species, try to, you know, are inspired by the species of that specific um, bird. So the idea is trying to make visible this invisible ecology that otherwise is being sort of interrupted and, and growing out these possibilities yet again. So the, that's the Swainson's thrush. Just to give you some examples, that's a white-throated sparrow uh, with some grass growing out of it. This is a Canada goose that seems to maybe even have a pepper plant. Uh, this is a cedar waxwing um, with another uh, group of uh, different species of, of plants. Not all, all of them germinate, and I actually I'm not a specialist in plants, so the next step is to find a collaborator who's good in botany that could help me characterize maybe these species. But the idea with this flying gardens of maybe is then to just, again, operationalize and make visible and make as a practice this idea of um, who is your community and where is it going. And can you reroute it even in other ways? Oh, before I get there, I just want to show you, here are some ways you might exhibit that. This was an exhibition of it at one of the Sullivan buildings, of Louis Sullivan down in, in Chicago, which uh, kills a, a certain number of birds a year itself. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so the next step you could do is actually put, clean those seeds and put them back in bird feeders uh, to allow those seeds to, with the prospect of maybe continuing their journey onward, um, in some other fashion. So there are some um, birds actually taking some of those seeds from this feeder here. Uh, so with the Flying Gardens of Maybe, actually another project that I've just taken up very recently um, is, uh, again, looking around for things that uh, I'm trying to understand as part of my community. So this is a tree that's on the corner of my train station that I go to work in downtown Chicago every day. And it's a, called the Kentucky Coffee Tree. Um, and one thing is you might notice is the really big, green, fleshy, leguminous uh, uh, pods of this tree. This tree has a native distribution largely of the Midwest, um, but you find it all over the north side of Chicago, and it, it, it uh, has these really interesting beans, and then it drops them in May, and they sprinkle all over the sidewalk, but they go nowhere. They either go down, um, they're either a street go up a, a street sweeper or they go down the gutter. And the beans are really, really hard, like uh, impenetrably so. And the pods are all gooey and green with this, this really weird gooey green um, ectoplasmic sap that oozes out. And as I did more research about it, it turns out that all of these things are highly poisonous. So if you eat the uh, pod, um, you can get anything from vomiting to, to uh, a heart attack. And some of these things were actually used by uh, native tribes to do things like um, do fish kills for strategic fishing or also to, uh, for, for folk medicines. But one thing raises the question is, right, in terms of the mutualism, who is eating this fruit? I can imagine a bird eating those tiny seeds like the way I just showed you for the flying gardens of maybe, but who's, who's taking on this fruit, right? Especially one that whose seeds are as hard as steel, like you really cannot break into them. The only way you can actually is either through a, the, the Arbor Day Foundation suggests you use a vise or you use a um, metal saw to cut into them and, and that are so poisonous. So I did some more research into this and um, these are just shots of them, like there you can see the green goo of them in the city streets of Chicago, um, this sort of remnant species. And it turns out um, it's thought that they might be a member of this larger group of species that um, Dan Jansen and Martin in 1982 uh, speculated might be anachronisms, evolutionary anachronisms. And what they mean by that is that they're plants that might have lost their mutualist disperser, mm -hmm. right, through extinction. And uh, their best guess is that the, the natural disperser for uh, 
this particular plant was the mastodon, um, which went extinct between 10 and, and 11,000 years ago. Um, contested, but probably a combination of climate change, but also human, human hunting. Um, but this makes sense for what they call the syndrome of the plant, because every plant has a seed that's evolved to have an adaptive suite of characteristics that makes it amenable and attractive, aesthetically speaking, to a disperser and not to others. So what on earth would have the metabolism that could handle something that's poisonous to everyone else, but actually have teeth that could still scarify a seed enough for it to germinate? The mastodon, um, right? And in fact, its teeth are of the size and of the kind that actually are, are able to handle um, this kind of fruit. So um, the, in this case, what's so interesting about the Kentucky coffee tree is it's this, it is this sort of an evolutionary anachronism. So it's, a, it's, it's a, a tree that's lost its mutualist, one of these flowering plants. And the question is, what then to do? Because on the, in the long term, this tree, therefore, is on its way, you know, potentially to extinction. So, um, but then as I thought about this further, you know, it seems like these seeds are like the original jawbreaker, really, um, but of the mastodon. So what would be the next closest corollary for that, like now, given uh, these trees in the urban midwestern space? So here's a, a, a whole candy machine of jawbreakers. So what I've taken to do is actually take these seeds and include them as well and start dispersing them through uh, candy jawbreaker machines. So for 25 cents, you can get between one and three seeds and directions for how to germinate um, the plant itself, uh, if you so choose. So the name of this project is New Economies for Anachronistic Fruit, uh, a Jawbreaker Syndrome. So I just want to close on this idea really quickly of like, well, what does this mean? So as an artistic gesture versus a biological one, um, it, is this simply an artist, a pathetic artistic gesture, as my friend Caitlin Bergen, an alumni here of MIT, would say, or is it something more meaningful? And I mean, one thing that I think is interesting to consider, especially in light of um, Naomi's really fascinating talk, is if you accept the logic of evolutionary biology and of adaptation and everything I said about ecology, then you have to accept the fact that everything about the history of life is based on the most random, contingent, and improbable event actually happening just once, right? Whether that be a mutation in a certain gene, whether that be the dispersal of a seed from one continent to another, whether it be um, the mating of, of two different uh, individuals, right? Every single step over 3.5 billion years is simply the history of the completely impossible happening, but at least happening once. So if one of these seeds happens to make it just somewhere else, in either case, for either project, um, you know, I think then you're actually embracing the natural history of the Anthropocene, but also of the deep time now, which is that everything till then and, and outwards into the future will still be um, these gestures in the most fundamental sense. That gets us back to this idea of finding out who your community is and, and who it might be. So thank you. <laughs>